Hello， 各位线上的观众朋友们，大家今天早安啊、呃！我是今天呃 A N D 讲座的主持人陈品一。那今天的这个讲座呢，是 A N D 以非日常作为主题所策划的第四场讲座。那先前我们有呃分享过呃借用 A I 去探索未知人类未知领域的像美味食谱的计划。那在七月底的时候也讨论过了人类跟科技。之间的呃依赖，但是又不想要被控制的这样的又紧密又矛盾的这样的一个关系哦。那我们今天会着重在于科嗯设计，还有视觉传达的这个领域。那今天很荣幸可以邀请到动态视觉的设计师 k i l m a r c h a n o s 来跟我们分享这个领域的这样的趋势，还有他自己的这个创作。那我们首先先欢迎 k i l k i l please say hi to us。Hello, hi. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, thank you, Q. 那我们今天呃邀请 Q 的原因呃不只不只在于他的设计的风格的独特性哦，而在于他为了设计而设计一款很特别的呃这个设计工具，那被称为叫做 Space Type Generator。那这个呃工具它的特点，第一个是它是一个开源的。网页式的这样的工具，那所以大家都可以使用。那再来就是它可以很立即的把文字讯息，呃，及时的转换成动态的视觉。那我们认为就是这样的一个特特点，呃，在于现在当下这样子，呃，资讯量爆炸而且变化非常快速的这样的时代中，它会是一个很快速又有效果，然后又吸睛的这样的一个设计的呃工具哦。那 k i o 在昨天，还有在上礼拜，我们总共也已经完成了一个为呃总长八小时的这个工作坊。那他的工作坊呢，主要是在于呃 P 5 JS 的应用教学。那 P 5 JS 也是呃 k i o 用来呃去研发呃 Space Type Generator 的这样的一个背后的呃工具。那今天的讲座呢，会呃比较着重在于 k i o 他从一个平面设计师，那怎么样透过自学 coding， 然后再到研发 Space Type Generator 这样的创作的心路历程。那所以等一下呃，如果朋友想要呃，可以跟 k i o 直接提问互动的话，那欢迎加入我们的 Zoom 的会议室，或者是在脸书上面看直播留言，呃，也是都可以的。好。那我们现在就呃，正式进入我们今天的讲座的主题，呃，为设计而设计的非日常设计工具。Hi, hello. My name is Kiel Magicnaus,、uh, and I'm here to give you a talk about my work and my process and some of the experiments I've been、uh, doing in my studio practice. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, A N D,、uh, and the Taiwan. Uh, Performing Arts and Technology Center. I'm so honored to be here.、Uh, looking back on the previous、uh, festivals, it's just so exciting to be included amongst your speakers. So、um, thank you very much, and thank you to the Dimension team,、uh, the Dimension Plus team,、um, for helping me and being such great hosts as we get all of this situated from afar. So I'm very much bummed to not see you all in real life,、um, but alas, here we are. Uh, so anyway, yes, I am Kiel Machiknaus, and I'm here to talk to you about my work. And specifically, I'd like to talk to you about my recent、uh, experiments in creating tools in my design practice, and thinking about designing tools and not designing designs. I've always very much been a designer that loves their tools.、Uh, my tools, Illustrator, Photoshop, After Effects, have always very much informed what I create, and I, and I know that's true with. Uh, all designers, but for me, I've I've never really shied away from hiding the tools. I've never、uh, felt like I needed to to shy away from that.、Um, so I've embraced that, and now I've kind of taken this next step into rethinking those tools by remaking them, revisiting them, and trying to figure out what is possible、um, if, rather than rely on default tools, you instead create your own tools or edit and hack. 
kind of your own tools. Uh, but before I go into that, I'm going to talk to you really briefly about my history. Um, I'm a graphic designer originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, I went to undergrad and got a BA in art and kind of really focused on graphic design. And I spent a couple years in advertising and doing some freelance work. And my work around there was very much focused on illustration and digital art making. I kind of had a, a passing fascination with typography, but like in retrospect, I didn't really know a lot about typography. I didn't really kind of focus on that. For me, graphic design was very, very much about reasons to draw interesting, cool pictures. Uh, and so I spent a lot of my time in Illustrator, playing around with crazy beziers and gradients and colors and really embracing the digital nature of everything. And I did do some typography work, you know, I but very much through the lens of illustration. So I think lots of my lots of my typography work um, I also felt like I had to draw in a sense or create from scratch. And so it was kind of a lot of illustration, digital art making combined uh, together. And so here's some of my early kind of static graphic design work. When I look at like the, the beginnings of my coding work, I see a lot of the seeds being planted in this project here. This was a project I did at Cranbrook Academy of Art, which is where I went to grad school for 2D design. And we were charged with creating a festival for a jazz festival in a jazz, a poster for a jazz festival in Detroit. Uh, and I took this opportunity to take a really type heavy approach to it. And I created this poster in Illustrator um, focusing on Gothic black letter script and black letter script, Gothic, you know, this, this type of typography, I think always looks good. It's always kind of really easy to accomplish and you can create some really interesting striking visuals with uh, just a few shapes um, and very much a, a and it's very much a modular approach right like lots of these letter forms are sharing other ones much more so than other uh, serif sans serifs um, grotesques etc even geometric sand uh, geometric faces um, I think black letter here gothic script um, is very modular uh, and what struck me as I was creating some of these type forms was um, how you can make some simple, small choices in one aspect of the letter form. And then by extrapolating that through all the other letter forms, you could create just a huge breadth of different visuals and variability within that typeface. Um, so with a, a Gothic script here, you know, you've got like the height, you've got some stroke widths, you've got some angles. And if you kind of make some of those choices and a simple O or an A, and then try to extrapolate that through all the other letters, you can create some wildly different solutions uh, for some of these core letters, um, just you know, with very simple choices. And so in Illustrator, I was doing this and I was kind of circling all these Bezier points over and over again and pulling it up and pushing it down and doing lots of you know, jockeying back and forth with these different uh, vector points. Um, and it was really satisfying, but it was, you know, it was really redundant. And so that's when I was in grad school. Uh, and a few years later, I kind of revisited this idea in a project I call Mercurial Black, which was a variable Gothic script. And this was kind of just as uh, variable typefaces were really kind of on the rise and were really becoming um, included in lots of different programs and everything. So this is right at the beginning of that, which is kind of a really exciting um, to be, uh, to take part in or to kind of feel like I was, I was kind of in that conversation as well. And so all of that, you know, variability and uh, circling Bezier points, pulling things, pulling all these vector paths up and down and recycling all these moves over and over again. It, of course, has a really great opportunity to automate some of that process. So I, I did that with this variable Gothic script, Mercurial Black, uh, and I planned out, you know, four kind of basic choices, you know, the height of the strokes, the width of the, the pen stroke, you know, if you will, if this was really a Gothic script, uh, and then the angles and the length of those angles that you would pull down your pen at to kind of create a very simple O letter form. And, you know, within those four choices, you can, you know, have a, a crazy amount, a, a wide spectrum of different visuals for how it would look. And so I planned out all of that. I did the math. Uh, luckily for me in, in undergrad, I, I'd done, a uh, I have a minor in math, <laughs> so I, I was like kind of really excited and, and comfortable with math. I've forgotten most of it, but there's still some kind of core tenets that I held on to. So I felt pretty comfortable 
uh, with cosines, sines, tangents, figuring out angles, trigonometry, et cetera, um, to figure out, given an origin point in these four core cho choices in your letter forms, what it would look like, where the other points would lie. So I kind of took some of those, uh, those basic sketches, extrapolated them in Illustrator, kind of created all these different uh, letter forms. And again, you know, this Gothic script's very modular, you know, so it's very easy to take this one choice, copy and paste it everywhere, make some minor changes in each of the letters to create a really robust typeface. And I got it working and it was really a, a super satisfying result to tackle these different letter forms, um, kind of tackle different problems within each letter form. So there on the left, you have a B and an R, you know, like what happens when the, when the right side of the letter form overlaps with that middle point. So lots of really exciting learning opportunities for me. And I was pretty new in JavaScript at the time. Uh, and so this is really an exciting exercise to learn coding, to learn typeface design, you know, really, cause I, I this is the, I guess it's the only typeface I've really designed and it's not even a real working typeface. Um, so lots of different challenges inside of here, really exciting um, solutions abound. Uh, and eventually those four small choices that the user would make extrapolated into this kind of crazy solution of ascenders and descenders, playing around with different uh, tiny little aspects of the letter forms. And then on the left there, you can see you could even separate the strokes as well to make a stencil looking typeface. So I had lots of fun with this. And, and in the end, which I thought was really exciting is you could download a scalable vector graphic an SVG. So you could uh, bring it into Illustrator and fix all the errors. Cause you know, it's, of course it's not perfect. It's a, kind of a, lots of mistakes in here. Lots of like really awkward moments, but you kind of have to do that if, if you're um, creating a variable typeface. But I think in the, in the end, you know, there's some really exciting solutions that came about you could create some very distinct looking typefaces um, with some very um, distinct choices and customization um, so this is still available on klm.land um, and i'm still very kind of pleased with this i would love to revisit it i know it's like fraught with errors and, and typographers are probably shuddering when they look at this but there's still a lot of exciting things going on there i think so this was uh, a few years ago, I don't know, six, six years ago, five, six years ago. And now fast forward a little bit more into my career at uh, the Maryland Institute College of Art, which is where I now work. So I, I graduated from Cranbrook uh, and then moved over to the DC Baltimore area and uh, am now currently teaching at Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, and I kind of teach lots of uh, motion design, 3D graphics, et cetera. Um, and I kind of, you know, draw, derive a lot of excitement from teaching some of these tools. Cause again, I'm so very much in love with, um, my tools. And so the, um, current space type generator, you know, another seed of it was planted when I was doing some of these, uh, motion tracking shots for my, uh, advanced motion graphics class at MICA. I, I was, you know, taking these video shots around campus. And then, you know, using that as fodder with my students to kind of do motion tracking shots and creating very simple 3D uh, typography and designs and placing them in the space. And if you've worked in After Effects at all, you know that this is like wildly simple. It is like so easy to take a footage of a, of a space, you click the motion tracking button, and then you instantly get all these pl points plotted. And then you can like lay down these cool graphics and like it's... I fell in love instantly. I thought it was so exciting. And so this kind of like augmented reality type of thing was also kind of um, gaining a foothold in some of the experiments going around in design. Um, and so I did this and I was of course very seduced and satisfied with um, how exciting this all was. And so I decided to like play around with some more letter forms. And so this is one I did in another, one of the beautiful buildings at, at MICA and decided like what if instead of just a regular flat signage it was this kind of chandelier shape um, and so i created these motion graphics and then kind of extrude or like place them around a center point you know so i mean there's a lot of pre-comps and kind of different graphics being 
rotating around a center point to kind of give it the illusion that it's on this cylinder. But these are all flat shapes. I kept playing with that. I kept iterating because, again, I'm kind of in love with tools. And so I thought this was so exciting and cool. So I created this fake chandelier um, in uh, the Brown building where I teach. Um, and kind of like extruded all of this and like doing something over and over again is also something I'm very much excited about. So I took that same idea. Uh, and then this time, rather than it just being a cylinder rotating, I also played around with changing the radius, adding a wave to the radius to make it kind of undulate and then offsetting that radius in space and in time to give it kind of this rippling effect. This was very exciting. And, and by the time I was like at this point, I had almost, you know, plotted out an entire typeset inside of After Effects. So all of these visuals were just inside of After Effects. I was shooting the footage on my phone, bringing that footage into After Effects, motion tracking, and then creating motion graphics to place in the space. And even though it looks maybe like it is all, it is plotted on a 3D surface, it's not. Those are all just like um, placed in space, pre-comped, rotated, pre-comped, rotated, et cetera. And so it was kind of a, a culmination of a bunch of interests I had. Uh, Bezier curves, vectors from Illustrator, playing around with those inside of After Effects, et cetera. Uh, and to kind of expedite this process, because it was a slow process, it is not a very smart way to <laughs> create some of these visuals. Um, but in order to expedite it, I was finding myself doing expressions, you know, and expressions inside of After Effects is this way in which you can plug in JavaScript into the layers of After Effects to kind of um, automate, to script some of the process. So I'd write these little blocks of code in say the radius of some of these type forms and say, you know, like, you know, go back and forth this much. And then as you're turning angle, you know, in, in this sort of wave. And so I started stacking a bunch of these waves on these different slices inside of After Effects and pre-comping them, repeating, uh, offsetting, pre-comping, resetting, presetting, offsetting, so that eventually you would get these um, very elaborate rings and chandeliers in space. And so again, all inside of After Effects, letters created in Illustrator, animated in After Effects, placed around in 3D space, um, and just repeated over and over again. And you could get these really exciting cylinders. Um, but, you know, it was it took forever. It was like very slow, did not work very well. Um, I mean, the visuals was super exciting, but you would have to like render these overnight. Um, you know, it, it was not a sad, it was not a, fruitful way to work it, it was very slow but i did get some like cool results so here's some uh this parking garage i shot and then placed uh some of these different sort of uh, animating letter forms in this still i think is maybe one of like the most exciting things i've ever done <laughs> i should revisit this this for me um is very exciting um, but some just simple scaling and, you know, all of these letters, this wasn't a real typeface. This is a typeface that I worked on that I now call lo-fi mono. And it was just a stroke created in Illustrator. Um, and then, it, it, and because it was just a stroke that I then brought into After Effects, you could scale it uh, and then apply the stroke to that path so that it didn't feel too awkward. You know, you didn't get really thick strokes on the bottom, really thin strokes going uh, vertically. Um, so it was all stroke. And so that's what, kind of what kept the, kept it a little bit more variable when I was animating it. Uh, and then I started playing with not um, cylinders. I started to play around with different waves. Again, still in After Effects, but After Effects with some expression. So a little bit of code started to seep into this just to make things faster for me as I automated it. Uh, same with, with some of these. So the one on the left there is a wave, but the one on the right is actually a noise wave. So a little bit of a random, but a Perlin noise. So it's a little bit more gradual and it's not, you know, jumping everywhere. Uh, and some of the math I had to do here to make it look as though it was plotted on a surface um, included the, the, each of these strings, you know, each of these letter forms, imagine them as a flat plane had to kind of look at the, the space above it and below it and kind of figure out what angle it had to be at. Uh, so it, it makes it look like it's smooth, but in actuality, the angle is very much um, being determined by a tangent, you know, trying to figure out the letters to the left and right above and below it, X space and Y space to kind of figure out where it should be pointed. So it makes it look very smooth, but again, it is, um, these are all just individual letter forms driven by um, expressions and after effects. These shapes, you know, eventually got very 
um, robust and wild. So I took a cylinder, I flattened it. Then I thought, well, what if I took a cylinder and then wrapped that around a cylinder? So I got a torus. And these shapes eventually just took forever to render and to load and to figure out. And I knew I needed to go somewhere else with it. Again, I was still in After Effects, but the tools were hindering me. After Effects was hindering me. But After Effects has some 3D, but it's not like a true 3D program. Um, so I did do forays into cinema. And inside of Cinema 4D, there's this Expresso editor, which is like a node editor. The node and expressions I'd been doing in After Effects, I thought maybe there's some synergy there. So I did explore it in the, this node editor, Expresso editor inside of Cinema. And I know I probably did not do this right. That looks like a mess. It's insane. <laughs> it's, it does not look intuitive at all. I probably was making some mistakes. And though it would still kind of glitch out. So it wasn't didn't work that well. I still got some interesting results. I was able to play around with waves inside of waves, um, you know, radius moving in and out, angles moving in and out. And still, you know, at their core, they're still very much made the same way I did inside of After Effects. Um, so, I mean, they worked, but the render time was still very slow. Um, and so then I thought, well, that's like a very 3D program. What if I pulled it back and I did a very simple program? Uh, and then I remembered, you know, having done those typographic experiments earlier, um, I decided to take it into processing. And processing is um, the P5.js is a JavaScript version. Processing is the Java version. And this is the one I kind of started off with. Um, and I've been learning um, processing a little bit on the side. And I think it's just such an elegant, beautiful system. You know, it's got a setup that draws once and then a draw loop that draws over and over again. And then if you make changes in that draw loop, you can create some very satisfying results. Um, and so here I had know, I know those like forms I had been making so intimately that I thought, well, I know that inside of After Effects, can I bring that same sort of approach and techniques and strategy into processing? So I took my type form, which I, you know, again, had been like playing around with for a while. I created a, a type, uh, um, a coded version of what I call lo-fi mono now that had a bunch of variables built into the height and the width. But still at its core, this is built the same way I did earlier in, inside of Illustrator, meaning it's all points, Bezier points, curves between those so that I could scale them and then apply a stroke to it so that it would keep its stroke width. Um, and, you know, the optics of it, it's still a little, you know, it's not um, super satisfying, right? I mean, the, the nuance of type is not here. Um, it, the, just the core basics of type are here, I would say. So anyway, um, I eventually got it all typed out uh, and then ran some experiments. And uh, to my surprise and to my shock, I mean, it, it ran perfectly, like immediately. It was so exciting. Um, so these are like the very first times I did it. <laughs> you know, this is, I don't know, three years ago, three, four years ago. Um, it was so sad. And as you can see, I'm like shooting it with my phone. I didn't know how to screen record. <laughs> Lots of this stuff makes me laugh. I also called it the typograph. Uh, I didn't call it space type generator. I called it the typographic chandelier generator. It's a very cumbersome name for it. Um, but it was so satisfying to be able to type into this code I had created, play around with some of these variables on the fly and see those changes take place immediately. I mean, like this for me, it still, you know, makes my head swim with how kind of exciting it was. Um, when I was in After Effects, I would make these changes. I would adjust the little sliders and the expressions. I would hit render. I'd wait a few minutes. I would wait overnight uh, and then see how it would look, you know, visually. Um, and here on like a much stripped down environment, like processing, like code, you know, without all the fancy 3D um, artifices of cinema or After Effects, I was able to create this kind of very robust, very satisfying thing. And from here, I mean, my practice about this just exploded and I started playing around and experimenting, you know, kind of at a, a just a wild pace. I was going so fast, playing around with different sorts of waves, different sorts of angles, shearing. Um, if, if I could change the variable inside of it, I added a slider to it and experimented that way. So the forms just got so quick and is so satisfying. Um, and over there on the right, you can see a little bit of that noise wave, this time applied to a cylinder. And then of course these got even bigger. So here's like what a torus would look like. So this is like the same cylinder, except wrapped around another circle, adding another wave to it, playing around again. 
Uh, it was just really satisfying and really exciting to watch. Yeah, if you see up there, typographic chandelier generator. <laughs> it does it does not sound, it, it's not a satisfying thing to say. Um, luckily, I changed that name later. But another thing inside of this playground, like, um, you know, I kind of didn't know what I was doing sometimes. So I've made lots of mistakes. So the thing on the right there, that's like a, a sphere I added a wave to. And then I tried to taper at the end. But rather than tapering it at the end, I made it inverse so it like explodes at the end. So it goes out to infinity at the end and like created this like just wild, beautiful explosion. Um, and I'm sure, you know, as a as makers yourselves, you know, if you switch up your tools, sometimes it leads to most satisfying, exciting results. And so code for how controlled it is still led me to some very unexpected waves. So lots of kind of very exciting visuals here. And something else that was really exciting was approaching it with a much more graphic approach. Uh, so here I've, I've got like some much more simple ones, maybe less focused on um, huge, massive shapes and focus more on very simple, simple elements and rather than crazy geometry, kind of like more pattern driven stuff and even played around with flat stuff as well. And this, this is actually super exciting. I had a student at the same time I was developing this, Mark Chan, um, who created his typeface unbeknownst to me, you know, in the almost the exact same way as I did with these different um, variables for height and width, um, you know, and thickness of the strokes. Uh, and so I was able to kind of copy his typeface, plug it into my generator and create these things like almost instantly in, in a very satisfying result. So that was kind of some wild, you know, kismet going on here that we were able to kind of plug and play it. Um, but because this is a, a real typeface, I would say where there's like an outer stroke and an inner stroke for some of those counters, um, it ran a lot slower because it just had so much more points to kind of figure out. Um, but still very satisfying, really exciting. Um, I started to play around with color, started to play around with patterns. Um, these almost remind me of kind of like fabrics. Started to play around with adding type. And then, you know, not only having type, but also graphic elements in the background. So again, for me, there's just so much excitement here of all the things you could do um, inside of a coding space based off of all these things I had made before. And so, I, you know, I was playing around with this. I was posting them on Instagram. I had lots of people very excited about it. I was very excited about it. I was kind of making at such a fast pace. But part of the fun of it was interacting with it. And with processing sketches, um, there's no place anymore to really easily host Java um, applets online. Uh, so the newest thing now is JavaScript. And so luckily there's P5.js. Um, and for me, part of the fun of the, this, these generators was actually manipulating it and allowing somebody to play around with um, all the different variations inside of it. So I eventually took some of these sketches I've been playing with, some of these generators, and translated them into P5.js, which is, you know, almost seamless. It's, it's like very quick. You know, there's a few language things you have to do, but to bring it into a JavaScript space as opposed to the processing space is pretty, pretty painless. Um, so I launched what I called Space Type Generator um, a few years ago, and there's, you know, tons of variation since. Um, but it was really satisfying to then like have the same stuff I had playing with in my on my desktop and bringing it online. Um, so I had cylinder, then I had field. Um, these are all, of course, online at spacetypegenerator.com. And cylinder and field were the first ones. Then those quickly grew into ones like coil and stripes, um, incorporating color. And, you know, for me, it was like each one of these would kind of lead into the other one, you know, like field was like, you know, type forms on a very X and X and Y scale with a couple Z ways. And then all of a sudden I was like, well, what if instead of typing in straight lines, it was around a circle. And so that led to coil and then coil was like, well, if you add colors to the background, you can create these wild shapes. What if I stacked those shapes? And then I got stripes. And so it's just like, so everything kind of manifests itself so quickly and was so satisfying. Um, so then I did one called Morisawa, which is, of course, a, a kind of a reference to that very famous John Maeda sketch where you kind of take things and repeat it downward. Cascade was something that I kind of just stumbled upon. That was kind of a very satisfying motion with stacking a bunch of these and then scaling them up and down and having them almost run into each other. Ribbon was one that was kind of um, it, it was kind of a wave, kind of sine waves, which I, of course, had 
that I have a fascination with, but then very much more of a graphic approach where it, they're just like half circles and how that would feel quite a bit different than the other ones. Um, flag was very much like field, but a lot more 3D. So there's kind of lots of exciting stuff going on here. Um, and so then uh, posting these online, you had lots of kind of different exciting solutions. Um, and people would create very beautiful things and exciting things. And so this kind of brought me to the next stage of Space Type Generator, which was much more about collaborating, you know, about um, posting these tools and allowing a user, anybody, um, to access spacetypegenerator.com and creating their own works. Um, so here we can talk a little bit more about that collaboration. So one of the exciting things that happened was um, an agency at, in Baltimore, Post Typography, who have a close relationship with MICA as, as a couple of grads from MICA's grad program. Um, they saw Space Type Generator and they kind of had like a really quick kind of um, latching onto it. They found it very exciting. Um, and so they approached me for creating a generator for one of their um, clients, the Grit Fund. Um, it was a nonprofit organization. And they took these screenshots and these screen grabs and kind of made their own mock-ups of it. And then they approached me and, and wondered if we could collaborate on trying to create some of these mock-ups um, that a user, that they could then give their client, Grit Fund, um, to, to create their own branded elements. You know, So now the space type generator being used in a much more commercial practice. And I've been working on a lot of that recently, but this was like one of the first early forays into that. And it was a very exciting prospect, you know, and it was just so satisfying to see other designers responding so positively to something I had created and then doing it themselves, you know, like as, as designers using the Creative Cloud, you know, we respond to the tools we're making and really like exciting designers create really exciting stuff. So now it's like, you know, I was kind of one of the tool makers and now I had very exciting designers create very exciting things. Um, and so they approached me with some of these screen grabs and said, is there something we can do like this? So we can brand it a little bit. Um, and I, of course, was very excited. And so we jumped into it. Um, first, we had to rework the typeface a little bit more because, <laughs> of course, I had, I'm not, uh, I play around with type, but I don't uh, feel like I'm a type designer. Um, and so uh, they, took a pass over lo-fi mono and we made lots of adjustments um, and lots of the simple shortcuts I had been doing, uh, we kind of readdressed and we made it look much nicer. <laughs> so they made it look much nicer. And then we did launch this uh, generator for Grit Fund where they could click around in these color palettes. They had their own presets, you know, for different sorts of posts and stuff like that. And so they could generate their own messages, uh, their own social media graphics based off of these presets that we were presenting. It was also really satisfying to see how post typography took some of those visual cues uh, and applied it to the rest of the identity. You know, so here it was like they were looking at space type generator, not just as a tool to make it, but they also allowed some of those similar sort of thin lines to to inform what the rest of the visuals would look like. Um, so it's kind of a very uh, beneficial relationship for both of them. Super exciting to see some of this, uh, some of this work. But, you know, like I kind of this space type generator has grown and as there's different versions, um, lots of users have been using the hashtag space type generator to post their own work using the generator and their own color palettes, their own language. And so there's loads of really exciting things happening online with space type generator. There's even these groups that are using it kind of really in depth as like kind of a, a core, you know, visual graphic. This makes me so excited to kind of see space type generator be try to be, you know, brought into um, a visual identity or language and, and trying to like kind of make them match as well or, or not make it feel like space type generators over here, their identities over here, but more like these are like a, 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 a singular system. And for me, that's been very satisfying to witness and experience. Uh, and here also it's, it's used as a layer um, for this uh, design for India conference. Um, I didn't even know about this, you know, some of these things. And, and again, that's kind of one of the most exciting things is that you release these and then sometimes you come back and see them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so here it's cool to see it as a different design layer inside of um, all this work. Very satisfying. Uh, 
<laughs> some other really um, exciting designers have used it. Maxim Doska created this like super beautiful poster uh, and sweater, and I'm kicking myself for not having one of these sweaters or posters. Um, but here it's like almost a, a little bit like a, um, you know, like a collab, like a one-way collaboration, you know, like this is a direct response from um, one of the presets inside of space type generator, but he's taken a screenshot of it, you know, kind of made it look a little bit like a um, screen print, added that beautiful type around it and created this like super beautiful composition. Um, and, and for me to like see like a, a response to one of those presets, um, kind of be so effortless and so beautiful is, is just super exciting to me. And Maxim and I would uh, eventually collaborate on something. And this is early on in the pandemic. There was a poster, t-shirt, AR sort of uh, creation we made. So he did the typography and the concept. And I created these motion graphics that then also lived in an in a augmented reality context where you could um, see, experience the motion with your phone. Other collaborations that have also been a little bit one-sided. I don't know if you can hear that, but um, if you can't, you know, I, uh, apologies. You should track down this music video. But uh, another kind of exciting uh, aspect of this is musicians that have used Space Type Generator as lyric videos. And this has happened a, a handful of times. Here's one by um, Ryan Norman, um, Break Your Heart. And I mean, this is this is wild. I had nothing to do with this. Aside from making the tools, of course, I didn't have anything to do with this project. Um, but he has, you know, gone in, used the different type generators, typed in different graphics, recorded the screen, and then like time remapped all of those recordings to the music because this is all synced up to the music. It's like so exciting and so satisfying and wild to see him respond to some of the presets, incorporated his own color palette. Uh, so exciting. Uh, and this isn't the only one. I mean, this whole thing is worth it. You know, you all should like track this down because there's some like super exciting compositions going on here, respondings. Oh, like, yeah, wild stuff, right? Like, I mean, really beautiful, really exciting. Um, another group, this duo Corbu, did a similar sort of thing. Again, here it's like not just space type, it's like gone through some filters. Um, some um, compositions, et cetera, using more, more recent um, space type generators. Oh, awesome, cool. Some like fun compositing going on here. And again, all responses to some of the, you know, some of the presets, making some of their own as well. So just like some really exciting solutions for, for some of this work that I've done. Again, totally worth checking out, please do. And you know, this is very space type generator driven. Um, but here's some other ones where they where it's a little bit more in the background or almost a layered element between all of it. So here you can see it edited inside of it in kind of very satisfying, exciting ways. Sometimes like, you know, cranked up to the max. So you kind of can't even tell like what the original intention was supposed to be. But oh, yeah, playing around with his graphic elements. Yeah, some really kind of exciting stuff going on here. It's also become part of campaigns. Um, this is um, a group in, in DC did the, did this capture for Congress, which is like kind of a very funny take on, um, you know, the role of um, politicians and, and kind of Republicans um, inside of reproduction, reproductive rights and stuff like that. So it's kind of some very cool stuff. And so this is a pack of um, stickers on the, the left here that a user could then download and then kind of used it in a very kind of graphic sense. So again, very exciting. Another really wild thing is uh, this was used in a mural for this um, artist, Lost Optics. And uh, where is this at? Um, Romania. Yeah, so this is like on a building, you know, and there actually is a, an AR component to this as well, where a user can look at that mural through their app. And um, these motion graphics here will actually play out. You know, some that you can maybe see a little bit of, of where space type generator is in here. And again, you know, like my involvement here was just making those the, the generators, you know, and then they kind of on their own did the color palettes, did the recording, did the different languages, the different colors. Um, so it's just so exciting and satisfying to see this as a result um, kind of of what's posted online. And I think this is maybe the, you know, physically biggest um, application of space type generator. So pretty satisfying. I also get it used a lot and sent to me. So here's um, these little flyers somebody did for um, uh, an opening 
for somebody to work with. Um, also, this is maybe one of the most recent wild things is somebody made a, a demo, a tutorial for how to use space type generator and posted it online, you know, and as somebody who, you know, like grew up uh, looking at these, watching these tutorials, it's just so wild to see now the tool I made is, is now online for somebody else to experience. Um, and of course, like, as they're using it, there's like errors and mistakes. And I just feel like bad, like, oh yeah, I know about that error. <laughs> That's a bad error. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, some of it's used in websites. So here's some animated GIFs that are being used that were recorded in the generator and then kind of used in, in different graphic elements. Re really cool results. You know, and another aspect of this collaboration is, you know, me setting up the parameters and then somebody else using it. So um, I went through a phase, you know, maybe a year or two ago where I thought it'd be really exciting if rather than, oh yeah, this was just last year. So, so rather than making it easy for a user to use it, um, I was playing around with physics at the time and I thought like, what if it was a little bit more of a challenge? What if, what if rather than the type, you having total control over the type, uh, the type actually kind of had a mind of its own. So here, every time you typed in a letter, it would generate a new physics-based object that could then run into other objects. And this kind of became, for me, the next step in collaboration was, could I um, create a tool that was maybe less like a tool and more like a game? Uh, and this evolved into something like this, where every time the user pressed a key, not just type, but also different barriers would come in. So you would type in a letter, or type in a word, and then every time you hit enter, it would add new elements. Um, and so it would give you kind of more debris to deal with. Um, so this kind of came became like a fun thing, like could you type what you wanted to type, but then have to deal with the consequences of having all this extra junk <laughs> lying around. So for me, this kind of almost is like a, like a roguelike video game, a, a video game where you um, every time you work on it, it's different. You know, every time you um, play the game, it's a little bit different. So here it's like, you kind of don't know what you're gonna get sometimes, you have to deal with it um, and you're supposed to fail a little bit. Uh, and then I decided, you know, what if in addition to graphic elements, there was also text frames that popped up. And so here was just a quick generator I made where you, everything has physics, so it all runs into itself. But then also when you hit enter, there's the chances that you'll get a text frame. And then you could download the scalable vector graphic, bring it into Illustrator and create your own, um, it would create your own posters for you, you know, and you could kind of have some say in it um, and kind of interact with it. But at its core, it's like, you know, you, a lot of it was not left up to you. And so this, you know, idea of, you know, conflicting, collaborating, but also becoming a little bit, um, you know, of a obstacle um, led me to this relationship with Studio Moot um, over in Europe. And they, saw some of these kind of experiments and wanted me to create a tool for the cover of Nova magazine uh, a year ago, over a year ago, last April, uh, a year ago from April. And they um, wanted me to create a tool for their typography magazine. And so I gave them one of these physics-based tools. Um, and it was, man, this was a terrible program for them to, to have used. It was such a challenge. Um, because even as they were working on it and using it, the program would get slower and slower be because of a fault of mine. I didn't code it very well. So as they, the more stuff they would type and the longer they would take to do it, the slower and more glitchy the program became. So it became like a huge challenge for them to do it. And I really shudder to think about like all the different challenges and glitches they had to face. But they eventually did create this very beautiful uh, magazine cover for Nova Magazine for their typography issue. Uh, and, you know, like some of the wild choices and placements, I mean, that's part of the appeal and the fun. What's also exciting is Nova does this cool thing where the production is also always very top notch, you know, so there's always a very physical output for it. So here the foil print and the very thick cardstock, there's some very exciting stuff going on um, in the physical version of it. So to have like very kind of digital physics coded um, background, then end up in a very kind of beautiful physical form is kind of, I think, the melding of both worlds kind of in a very satisfying result. I also just recently launched, um, and I don't know if they've launched this yet, um, but worked with uh, Urban Splash, and they've got a new initiative, the Future Lab. And so this is, the, they're part of their identity is um, uh, 
this typographic form. So cylinder and field and cascade. So they took some of the space type generator stuff, um, applied their own colors and um, typography to it. And so we've been collaborating on this tool that users will be able to kind of generate their own uh, media from. They'll be able to download static images or looped graphics. And then of course they've got their own like presets so that a user can kind of create the the branded versions of some of these visuals as well. Um, and now I've kind of been working more with HTML and CSS. So I've kind of been making things look a little bit more exciting and, and a little bit more nicer. You know, the tools I think are starting to look a little nicer. Um, so then now, you know, aside from those collaborations, I've also been bringing some of these tools into my own studio practice. Um, so this next part is, is a little bit more about how all this space type generator, all of these kind of processing coding sketches, how those now have found their way into my own practice. Um, last year, you know, at the beginning of this, this last year, 2021, I was approached um, by MRM McCann to uh, work with Memorial Sloan Kettering to create this video that they do to thank their donors. Um, and the thing with these donors is that they projected that there are going to be like 10,000 names that they're going to have to do and that they weren't going to have those names until the year was over. You know, so they had this giant spreadsheet of all of these donors that we knew was coming, but we wanted to, we need to create these visuals um, before we finally got it. Um, we had to, we had to create a creative motion graphics, um, you know, to thank them um, before we heard what the final list was before we got the final list. Um, so here uh, they approached me, they asked if I could kind of help out with creating these motion graphics. And for me, you know, thinking about um, coding, I mean, this is just the perfect melding of motion graphics um, and coding and automating process to come up with a solution. Um, so I created this generator that would take in these names and create these various landscapes. So this is made in processing, not in um, P5.js. This is the desktop based one. It just runs smoother and you can kind of don't have to worry about hosting it online or anything. And these are tools just for myself, you know? So these are tools that I created just for myself as the person tackling some of these motion graphics um, for how to do it. And so this is a very robust tool. It took like, you know, 200 names. It would take 200 names, create a motion graphic out of it, you could animate the size of the waves, the angle of the camera, where the camera would go, how far apart these layers were, whether or not they animated in or out. And so it was very much like a typographic driven solution for this. Um, and you can create just a whole breadth of different sort of um, uh, motions of these different names. But of course, these names sometimes need to be legible. So another tool that I created based off of the same sort of thing um, was a tool where, where like the names would settle. So you would have a selection of names, they would animate in like the other animations and then settle for a little bit so that if you were a donor um, and you came across the C's or, you know, the E's, you could find your name in those sections and then it would settle and then dissolve back into it. Um, and this is a really fun project, a really huge undertaking to try and figure out how to get through all of these names and keep it engaging. So we eventually kind of came up with this um, process where there were kind of, um, you know, uh, there were visuals that were a little bit more flourishes and, and a little bit more cinematic and epic in scale. And that would then settle so that you could read your name and then kind of dive back into more um, visually interesting ones where you, it was less of a, a challenge of reading them and more of just kind of being immersed in this typographic landscape. And so the final piece was um, there's some music here again, again, totally worth tracking down and listening to. You can find the link on my Instagram, um, but it's beautifully set to music. Um, they had somebody score this. Um, it's just super beautiful, super exciting. But here you see, you know, like this beginning part where these names start to just shoot on, you know, and then they start to build and you get this idea of all these names being written in light and these landscapes forming. Um, so here it was almost a little bit like being a director as well of trying to figure out these different shots, trying to figure out what the excitements were. So there you see a flux and then eventually it kind of like goes into this settling. So here you can read some of the names, et cetera, and then jumping into the next scene. 
And then there's some interstitial scenes in between. So this was taking a lot of what I had learned about with coding um, and creating these generative visuals and then also kind of reining them in and making them a little bit more applicable. Um, I've also, oops, sorry, jumped ahead there. Um, also recently I've gone into more editorial illustration with um, some of these generators. So this is a, a New York Times illustration asked me to create, use one of these visuals, one of these generators for both a static image and then a motion graphic online. So here you see kind of that tool in action. And what's wild is, you know, like they asked me to do this, but you could have used the tool itself online and just done a screen recording. Well, that's not 100% true. There's a little bit of kind of um, <clears throat> custom stuff going on um, in their version. But some of these tools now, I have access to them. I'm playing around with them. I'm starting to include them in my editorial work. Um, so this string version that I've been playing around with earlier <clears throat> kind of found so I, I used some of that in this um, uh, this uh, editorial about TikTok and the United States and China and Microsoft and when all that craziness was going on last year. Um, so yeah, there, there's like you know some some um, some synopsis between these. So like the, even though the final thing was composited in After Effects, I created some of those in code, and this kind of keeps happening. So now. Some of the tools I am using, some of the tools I've grown used to, After Effects, After Effects, and such. Um, but I'm also using coding to create some of the visuals. So here, this eyeball, the inside of that iris, is actually created in processing, and um, the actual um, motion graphic of the eyeball blinking um, is done inside of After Effects. And I'm seeing lots of this happening, and it's kind of been very exciting. So this recent one I did um, with these velvet ropes this seamless loop, I, I use some of the same ideas I had with this Morisawa generator with placing it in time and scaling things to make things look smaller and playing with this illusion of, of space. This Wall Street Journal one also used a generator. So I generated the skin of this globe inside of processing, brought it into Illustrator to do some compositing and some more motion and to make that um, fade happen inside of After Effects. Um, and so now it's really exciting that I, I have domain over some of these tools. And now some of the, those decisions are kind of informing what my visual solutions are for these. Um, so now I'm kind of jumping back and forth between these tools I've created, these tools I've grown to love, you know, the, the, some of the Adobe products, et cetera. Here's some fun with physics. You've maybe seen some of these, um, me posting these earlier. This is a fun fabric simulator inside of processing. So I took that and then did some compositing inside of After Effects um, and made a motion graphic out of that. Um, and some of these have, you know, kind of departed from um, the coding altogether. I mean, I still look at these and I still see things I've learned from coding. You know, some of these motions are very much After Effects-y. Some of them have a little bit of, you know, some things I've learned through creating the generators inside of them. So this is a series of icons I created for um, this newsletter, The Deal Book. Uh, at icon set, you know, icon set in, in the New York Times kind of inspired by Bauhaus. I mean, like that's like a dream come true project. So this is very exciting um, and very thought, fun um, to work with and make. Um, and here you see kind of a lots of different layers of things I've been working with. So here is some blender for some of the 3D coding for some of the layers on the left. Um, after Effects for compositing all of it together. Um, this is for the You're On campaign from Ray-Ban from last holiday season. And so lots of the things I'd been working with with the generators kind of blended into this project as, as well. Um, also have done some work with uh, The Verge, which you know I visit it on a daily basis. So this is of course super exciting when they asked me to, to work on some motion graphics for um, around the election last November. Um, and here, you know, we had a conversation, I pitched some of those sketches and visuals for this idea, and we had this conversation on how to create them, how they should be displayed. And for time's sake, we kept them as just motion graphics. Um, but there was a, some talk about trying to create these in code, which is, you know, still very possible. And, and the visuals themselves, you know, when I look at them, they're informed by some of the stuff I'd been working with at the time, these stripes of graphics, which I'm sure you've seen quite a, in quite a few of my 
um, pieces and work. And so here that kind of became a, um, a visual motif that was brought through the whole thing and it kind of, you know, um, blended into the After Effects work. So these are just motion graphics, straight motion graphics, but seeing them in action is kind of a really, um, really exciting and really satisfying to kind of see them all over <laughs> The Verge. Um, so yeah, they're like informing my coding work and my After Effects, my motion graphics work are really informing themselves in kind of a very satisfying way. The Verge has also just used spacetypegenerator.com, which is super exciting and satisfying. Um, so there on the, the right, you've got the string generator. On the left, you've got the danger gen generator. And these are both generators that are, you know, available for um, anybody to use. And I just asked, you know, for a plug, which I always get, which I get most of the time. So that's really exciting just kind of see it pop up as, as well. Um, and also great to see them, you know, in a, you know, a, a commercial context, in an editorial context, even if I'm not doing them. So that's all very satisfying. So the more recent ones have had less to do with waves and more to do with a little bit more scripted or random motion. So here with um, the danger one, I'm trying to you know play around with different sort of graphic using a Perlin noise and a slight um, with other typefaces to kind of like tweak you know like what we what you can do with typography and with images um, inside of P5JS. Um, so these have been kind of a lot more graphic, you know, yeah, I, I guess that's maybe some of the goal of these is to make them feel a little bit more like graphic projects, um, rather than having them be um, kind of, you know, ambient generative motion as well. I've also been playing around a lot with these Bezier curves and applying graphics to these Bezier curves. And again, you know, as, as you saw in those earlier slides, you know, I have a great love for vector graphics for Bezier curves and stuff. And so um, seeing that kind of reintroduce itself into my practice has been really exciting and really fun to experiment and play with. This also has given me the opportunity to become a little bit of a hand lettering artist. Um, I have such a love of like those hand lettering, you know, designers out there. And I think they're so talented and create such beautiful things. And I fancy myself, I, you know, I, I guess maybe I wish I kind of was <laughs> one of those type of artists, but I've gotten to use um, that string generator to create some graphics and also got to work with uh, Wolf Olins um, and Forrest Young at Wolf Olins to create some of these graphics. And I mean, that was like a dream come true. I'm a big um, fan um of Forrest Young's and I'm a huge fan of Wolf Olin's I have been you know since I learned what graphic design was um in undergrad and so to, you know to be in this space where I'm now working with some of those people has just been so um, exciting for me so this is a uh, part of their because series where um Forrest Young has conversations with these really great designers so the previous one was a muralist. This one is fashion designer Mary Ping. And this was kind of a playoff of her very intricate woven sandals um, that she makes. And so we created these loops um, of these different hoops, you know, kind of working inside of um, each other to kind of create that same sort of woven structure. Another recent, you know, like what is what is next for space type generator? I've got a couple ideas of things I'm working on. Um, this is a project I'm calling Word Art Plus where it's a very kind of modular composition tool where you can use some of the motions I've created in other generators, like the, the cylinder, um, the wave, um, a new like kind of um, fancy jumping word art sort of thing. Um, and you can create these different modules and affect these modules and, you know, by clicking and dragging, move them around the space. And then you can create kind of your own animated flyers. And, and that's the solution there. And I haven't posted this one online yet because I'm still kind of working through some things. And, uh, you know, the end of it is always really hard to kind of package it and get it in a satisfying result. Because it's still, you know, for me, that's kind of the most boring part. You know, for me, the, the experiments are the most fun part. The actually making it usable to a user is like not as exciting for me. So I always lose steam right before I launch something, which is, you know, sad. And I know I need to <laughs> address that. But eventually, you know, soonish, hopefully, um, I'll be posting these online for people to use. And I've been playing around with different colors and different applications of this. And, and there's some very, really excite, satisfying, exciting results of this. I did use it recently, um, you know, for our grad, uh, for seniors at MICA. Um, I, over the past couple of years, we've used some space type generator stuff to create specific bespoke flyers for them, 
you know, for these grads to kind of celebrate them. Since we haven't been physical, you know, in the in the same space, um, since we've all been, you know, interacting online, we've been creating these um, online portals to kind of celebrate them. So um, 2020 is on the right there, which is this kind of confetti thing I was going through at the time. And then 2021 has the um, um, Word Art Plus, um, kind of an early version of it, um, which is actually pretty close to, I think, how it will end up looking. Another thing I've been working with, and for me, this is kind of like brings my practice full circle, is like I was playing around with some of these walk cycles years ago. Um, and now I'm creating them in code, which is like really exciting. It's really complicated and probably ill-informed, <laughs> but I'm getting some very satisfying, exciting results. And there's so much potential, I think, with these to kind of create these looping motions that then you can decorate um, or animate with whatever you type into them. And so that's what I've been working with uh, recently, playing around with different colors and textures to kind of do some like wild things with them. Um, so here there's just a bunch of different patterns being applied to different limbs, different sizes of different things. And earlier on, I was kind of doing these um, in After Effects to kind of like edit them all together. But recently I've been trying to think about how to generate parades right away from the get go. And so that, that's been a challenge as well. And so, I mean, these have, I think, so much exciting potential. I, of course, have been adding sliders to them so that a user can kind of like add their own things um tweak different limbs different body sizes play around with different textures um etc so this is wrought with possibilities i'm like it's uh, overwhelming what you could do with this <laughs> so i'm having to like kind of constantly stop and say like what am i doing here you know like are these always just random are these always editable are there different versions of this um so i still need to kind of figure out what this is going to look like in the end and then aside from that, I'm, you know, constantly working on different sorts of codes and kind of remixing some of my own thoughts and sketches and kind of coming up with new visual forms and ideas. So lots of these are kind of derived from other things I'm working on. I'm working on something. I'll think, well, what if this and that will lead to it's a brand new block of code. You can see some string in here. You can also see some other sketches from other times. Um, so I'm kind of constantly kind of iterating and, and asking myself, what ifs? I'm trying to figure out different solutions just to kind of keep fresh on like different challenges or, or different possibilities inside of here. And so I think space type generator, you know, there's going to be more variations coming through different possibilities, et cetera. Um, some of these things I was working on quite a while ago, I need to revisit, you know, some of these were wrought with problems, but I think I've found solutions to them. Um, so I'm still constantly kind of doing different <clears throat> experiments, interactions, kind of wondering how to package some of these for an online generator um, and kind of running it, running into, you know, like what JavaScript is even possible with, with doing. And some of these have a little bit more of like a kind of structural feel to them, um, et cetera. And then also kind of revisiting and playing around with different type forms, um, et cetera. Um, so that's what's next for space type generator is just like more, more experiments, more um, trying to figure out what these, what the, the different tools can do and how we can um, remix them. All right. I think that is my time for today. So thank you so much. Um, if you've got any questions, you know, please send me a message on uh, Instagram or over email. Um, reach out and I'd um, love to touch base. Thanks again so much for having me.好的那对就是大家如果好有什么问题的话可以想一下来提出那我先呃我先讲一下我个人的感想好了因为我参加了就是看了这个讲座然后也参加了两场就是呃 可以看得出来他非常的乐在其中，就是会一直不断的再去呃去探索更多，就是space type generator 可以展现出来的更多更多种设计的可能性，然后他看起来也非常的就是爱自己，呃，一直以来做的作品这样子，所以我就是很蛮好奇的是说他怎么样在可能在前期。
呃，一开始在探索的时候会碰到一些，至少会有可能会有一些挫折什么的，但是他是怎么克服的？因为我们在工作坊的这段期间看得出来，他真的需要非常多的练习。那这些练习跟探索，对，很花时间。那他是怎么样可以让自己保持这个动力，继续探索下去？Mm. So while everyone thinking about questions or comments or feedback, let me start with my thoughts. And I participated in two、uh, workshops and I listened to this talk as well. I'm very impressed by your work, and I, I see that you really enjoy and making all these things together. So I'm just curious about that. As we know in the workshop, that it takes a lot of time to practice and explore. So I wonder how do you try to overcome some of the initial obstacles, and how do you keep motivated in the process? Because it takes a lot of time to try and find errors. Yeah, that's great, and that actually came up in the you know the workshops we did over the past couple of weeks. Some of it is lots of googling. You know, <laughs> lots of admitting to yourself that it's a struggle、uh, to kind of figure out some of the math or some of the backend stuff. It's also playing into some strengths. You know, some of the things you already know. So, like thinking about how you can leverage the knowledge you already have in these new environments, so you don't feel like you're totally starting from new, but maybe you can rely on some of the. Uh, elements and、uh, skills you already have, and then kind of remixing them together.、Uh, so that's what keeps me motivated: is, is thinking about these new ways to maybe recontextualize some of the、uh, lessons you already have and, and some of the skills you already have. So, 对我来说，当然这过程里面会有很多的障碍，或者很多的这个需要克服的事情。但我觉得，其实每一个人在做练习跟学习的时候，都其实都并不是完全从零开始，大家都会运用到很多自己以前知道的知识或经验，然后把这些东西试图重组起来之后，重新混合混搭，看看有没有新的可能性。所以对我来说，这个尝试的过程其实很有趣，或者是很有意思，因为可以让我知道过去学过的东西到底有哪些可以重新拼凑起来，或者是重新利用的可能性。那现场的哎 ，OK， 现在有一个问题，呃，那我我帮他念好了。呃、uh, ，During the lecture, the non-processing、um, is mentioned. Is processing a tool or just meaning on working? By the way, what is P5Js? OK, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. So you, you see this, this, this the questions in the chat rooms? Yeah, maybe you can answer that. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. Well, I was actually having a discussion about kind of processing for this tool is not a very, very good name for for it because processing is such a、um, commonly used term and、uh, gerund, I guess.、Um, but yeah, processing is the tool, and processing is kind of the desktop Java based one, and、uh, P5JS is the、uh, processing's initiative to bring it into a JavaScript library. So yeah, they, I kind of use them interchangeably, and I think I did that throughout the lecture.、Um, but yes, processing and P5JS are kind of the same ways of working with the code. 所以 process 的确是一个工具。那这个工具其实呢，他觉得其实这个因为 process 这个字用的是呃太频繁或者太常见，它很多人在使用不同的情境，所以可能会让大家有混淆。所以不论是 processing 或 P5JS， 其实都是在这个、这个 JavaScript 这个环境里面，试图把这些的工具运用或整合在这个新的创作环境里面。所以的确刚如果刚才所问的一样 ，process 是一个工具。然后跟 P5JS 一样，是试图把这些工具或者把这些东西呃整合，或者是纳入汇入到呃呃 JavaScript 的过程里面。嗯，好，呃，那就是针对刚刚在讲 processing 跟 P5JS， 然后那我自己其实也是呃第一次，就是因为上了工作坊，才第一次就是比较试图要去操作 P5JS， 然后真的会觉得说。呃，真的 coding 的世界真的是好好无限大，就是你真的是写一写 code， 然后它就可以产生出非常多不同的变化。然后，呃，对，这<笑>总总而言之就是它正开启一个新的世界啦。那就是觉得说这个领域真的是，呃，有机会的话大家可以尝试看看这样子。然后， so, 好。
Okay. Yeah. For, for me, that because of the workshop, this was my first time to try seriously trying to work out on a P5JS. And it was for me, like, it tells me that actually this coding world is like mind blowing because you can actually see all kinds of possibilities and uh, yeah. the upper uh, opportunities actually are indefinite. So for me, it's just, this is my experience. Mm. Okay. 那另外我们再有一个问题，就是说，呃，我们刚刚看到 Kill 他有透过呃，就是呃 ，Space Type Generator 去做了一些合作，像是说那个关于一个性别议题，在那个《纽约时报》的这样不同的这样子的一个合作，那就是会会为某一些特殊的议题呃发生。那我不知道他自己在呃 ，Kill 自己在做这些呃合作的时候有没有一些。经验跟感想，那或者说这些议题是不是真的呃透过呃就是这种动态视觉的传达会更有影响力？嗯、hmm. ，So in your presentation you mentioned that you are using space type generators to participate or like you um、uh, collaborate with some organizations, for example in、uh, the New York Times examples you actually work to talk about the reproductive rights and all the other issues. I wonder that it, um, what are your experiences during this process to talk about specific issues? And do you think that because of using all these generators and all these、uh, graphics, it will be more influential source and you can spread the words further to the public? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess on the on my Instagram and、um, some of those messages, yeah, I, I haven't wanted to shy away from. You know, we've been through some pretty tumultuous times, so I'm. You know, I love that they can maybe be used to spread these messages in more dynamic, eye-catching, exciting ways.、Uh, I think that's a, a very cool, and, and you know, being able to、um, have these in something like the New York Times, you know, being able to use these tools in that、uh, publication is, you know, like it's just a thrill to have it be part of the conversation.、Um, see it being used for, you know, this very pure、uh, visual communication. Um, so yeah, I think it's been a, a satisfying result to use with it.、Um, you know, I sometimes I feel like I, I just need to kind of like let it be. You know, let these conversations be had other places. But、um, yeah, I'm very glad to see that it's、um, uh, being used kind of in positive lights,、um, in, in in positive news and stuff. So yeah. 所以对我来说，当然有机会可以透过不论是 Instagram 或者其他不同的社群媒体，把这些讯息透过这些比较吸睛的图像或这些动态的这个视觉图像，然后让大家看到这个这些议题是非常对我来说是非常有帮助，也非常乐见这样的情况。而且比如说有机会跟跟这些不同的呃媒体合作，比如说《纽约时报》等等，去触及到这些议题，尤其是现在我们在面对这么多困顿还有很多变化的时刻里面，有机会把这些的工具，再把这些设计运用在比较正向或比较正面的。资讯或这些新闻对我来说也是非常值得跟难得的经验。好，那还有没有更多呃感想或者是问题想要提供的 ？Okay, let's see if there are any. Oh, there's other questions and comments.、Uh, 这边是说想要请问 Q， 未来有考虑使用其他的软体去做呃设计工具的实验吗？像是说 Touch Designer。Um, so this question is asking, like, if you are thinking about using other software to design tools and do experiments, like using such designers, for example. Yeah, it's a, it's high on my to do list. <laughs> I would love to explore Touch Designer. I I you know I see it in the the chat, and I'm instantly like, oh yeah, I need to get on that. So I mean, there's lots of places I would love to explore. I would love to you know play with Touch. Designer, open frameworks. You know, there's just a, a long list of things I would love to explore. I haven't worked with Touch Designer, but it it seems to have a, a ton of potential, and、uh, it seems to like kind of really fit into this modular looping sort of way of, of constructing graphics. So、uh, I haven't tied my to do list, and, and I'm really excited. 那我其实就刚刚看到这个问题，我突然想到，对 ，Touch Designer 是一个我很想要去试用的东西。那其实我一直都想要去试试看其他不同的工具，比如说刚才提到 Touch Designer 或者是 Open Framework 等等，我还没有时间，还没有机会去尝试。但我的确觉得这个东西对于我们这种有像类似循环式、动态式视觉的工工具的话，的确有很多可以整合在一起的机会。嗯，好，那接下来我们有来自连友 Keep 的的提问呢、哦。
。那他问了两个，我先呃就是念过。第一个问题是说 ，most of your wonderful work and the generator use and apply existing data set database. How do you think the real time data visualization with your generator? Uh, okay. Looking to look into your real time data visualization work. Space time generator is based on the idea of space motion tracking idea. Do you really want to develop spatial uh, installation with your uh, kinetic typography, for example, like the video installation? It's also on the chat room. Yeah, great. Those are um, great questions. I'll, I'll do the first one here. The um, the thought about data sets. Uh, yeah, that's really exciting. Um, that Memorial Sloan Kettering one, I think that was for me the, the first example of me using data sets or, you know, like uh, uh, information, you know, from uh, tables and outside documents, plugging it into some generators. So I think it's a really, you know, um, processing is kind of like built to work like that. Um, and so you can create like tons of beautiful visuals. I haven't really dove into, you know, generating um, real time data visualizations yet, uh, but something I'd really love to, you know, especially, you know, with P5JS living so beautifully on the web, the ability to plug it into existing APIs uh, is something, yeah, that, that makes me really excited. And, and looking at some of the more compositional work I'm doing now, I mean, I think that could really lend itself nicely. Uh, so yeah, something I'm definitely thinking about and, and definitely excited about. Uh, and then the, the second one here about um, placing it in space. Yeah, you know, originally some of the, the genesis of the space type generator work was about augmented reality and placing it in 3D space. And, you know, just like touch designer, it's high up there on my to-do list. <laughs> I would love to explore AR and VR a little bit more, um, place some of these sculptural pieces, you know, in, in a, you know, alternate reality sort of space. I think that is um, so exciting. And, you know, there's so much development being happening in some of these coded libraries that it, that's not far off. So again, you know, like when, once I get uh, some space to slow down, that's something I, I would love to explore. Uh, in, in, in terms of installation, yeah, I'm, I actually am going to have it uh, installed in a, a couple places in the fall here. Uh, and so that's really exciting. I, I think what we're going to be doing is just video projecting it on a flat surface. Um, but thinking about having these exist in a 3D space, whether consumed through a screen or um, or some other sort of apparatus to activate a 3D space. Um, I'm, I'm not there yet, but uh, I'd love to. So yeah, I'm really excited for um, installing some of these in a, a physical space. 好，这两个问题都非常感谢刚才的连友 Kiss 提问。那其实这两个问题都是我觉得非常好的问题。那这这刚才尤其像第一个问题的话，讨论到是资料组。那刚才各位看到的这个案例的话，其实是我啊、呃、这呃这这阵子开始，比如说把这些资料组，比如说都把把表格啊或其他资讯从文件里面把资讯汇入到这个 generator 里面，然后去产生出来的一个图形跟作品。那其实的确很多未来有很多在 P 站 G N J 呃，比如 processing 就是一个很适合做这样的模式的一个工具。那另外一方面。网络上现在很多的 A P I， 所以未来有很多可能性，有很多机会可以去尝试试试看。那到另外一个第二个问题，关于空间的话，其实就像刚才各位看到简呃在演讲当中的时候，我的一开始的这个 space time generator 的这个开始的起点，其实跟 A R 有关系。那这个就跟 touch designer 一样，都在我现在的代办事项清单，或者是想要做的事当中排名很前面。我希望之后有机会有更多时间可以去尝试，比如说 A R V R 等等的，因为现在有很多的新的观念跟新的想法。在发展之后，我们现在看很多的城市码的这个资料库里面，也有很多新的发展，这些都是我之后想要去尝试看看的。那至于在这个装置的部分的话，的确我们今年秋天会有一些装置作品在美美国展出，不过现在的这些装置作品还是目前把这些资讯投影在或者这些这个这些视觉作品投影在这个平面上面。那未来的话，也许我们可以去尝试尝试看看，把这些的像雕塑型的作品，唐投是在立体的东西上面，或者是一些其他的这个呃投影面。上面让它会有一些不同于平面的效果，这些都是我们可能未来的想法。嗯，好，那是现在我们的不知道我们的就是聊天室跟或者说线上有没有呃，这有参加工作坊的学员
，有没有要有没有一些感想啊，或者是提问，呃，要想要发表的。Some of the participants here, I think, are from our workshop in the previous day. So I wonder that if they have any ideas, experiences they would like to share with us after playing with the PFIJS for a few days.、Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now there is a question. Is want to ask Kyo about using coding in the advertising campaign. Uh, have you ever had any difficulties or ideas? 那主要想要了解如何把呃、uh, creative coding 融入在现在有的呃、uh, motion graphics pipeline 里面，希望可以得到一些呃 Q、uh, 的经验分享。So when we ask、uh, ask about the codings when you are using exactly into these um advertising or different projects, what are the challenges you encounter and what are the obstacles you would try to you have tried to overcome? And also, I would like to know that how do you integrate the creative coding process into the existing motion graphic pipelines, and what kind of, what are experiences you can tell us? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. <laughs> yeah,、um, some of the the coding. The creative coding I've been doing has been a little bit, you know, teaching myself how to do it. So sometimes there's visuals I want to create in my mind, some、uh, sort of functionality I want to create.、Uh, that's you know, like I, I kind of have some barriers of not knowing it. I'm kind of bumping into、uh, my edges of not knowing how to fully develop applications or generators or be able to export. Certain files,、um, or or have it, you know, speak in a certain way with、uh, other sort of applications.、Um, so being able to kind of deliver on what I talk to a client with, you know, there's some challenges there in terms of、um, where my knowledge, where where my comfortability with a coding environment kind of butts up with what I can actually execute and what is actually feasible with my current skill set. Uh, but you know that's constantly evolving, so I'm I'm really excited by kind of you know each each project I learn a little bit more, I get a little bit more comfortable in delivering a, a product or executing on a visual that is doable.、Um, some of the you know and, and on that same point, you know some of the editorial illustrations I've been doing,、um, I'll be talking with the art director and we'll have a few ideas or we'll be hitting concepts back and forth and. Um, lately, you know, the question of whether it's developed entirely in code or with After Effects or a mixture of both、um, has kind of faded to the background. You know, so now it's kind of just working on the visual aesthetics of it,、uh, and then once you know we decide on on a vision, then trying to figure out, okay, is this something that we have time to develop fully in a code, or do we need to do it in、um, After Effects? Do we need to kind of cheat it a little bit?、Uh, I shouldn't say cheat it. You know, these are all tools and, and、um, way modes of making.、Um, so yeah, sometimes it kind of bounces around all the the different pipelines. I would say. 然后在这个过程里面，其实我因为我是自学这些不同的 coding， 还有不同的这些的创创作方式，所以其实有时候我会对心里面有一些不同的功能的想象，或者心里面有些图像想去创作出来。但是实际上执行的时候，也许是因为我现在目前自己的啊编写程式码的技巧，或者我现在自己的技能等等，会有一些限制，会有一些我无法完全去实际落实的情况。不过当然这是一个不断在进步、不断在演进的变演变的过程。我随着我自己的技能啊、技巧，还有学的学习的经验啊，慢慢成长之后，它都。会有一些新的变化，有新的状态出现，所以有些问题过去可能存在，现在随着这些问题慢慢的啊、呃、练习之后，或者是培呃发展之后呢，开始有机会可以克服了。我们现在之前看到跟媒体合作几个经验里面，其实一开始都是先跟艺术总监讨论，那呃一开始可能以以前可能一开始讨论的是要完全用呃城市码来完成呢，还是要去结合 After Effects 等等的工具来完成，但后来现在这些工具或技术的讨论反而变得没有这么的啊、呃、变得最。呃，并不是我们一开始讨论的重点。我们一开始还是决定去强调，呃呃，把问题放在这个视觉上面的美学如何，然后决定好美学之后，再去再去思考有没有可能完全用。编码的方式来完成，或者是如果时间不足够的话，有没有可能去结合搭配其他，比如说 After b a c k s 还有其他的工具等等。所以对我来说，现在这些不同的工具都是可以选选择的选项，只是取决于我们到底有没有办法执行出来，然后有没有足够的时间可以执行。好，谢谢。那再来是脸书的观众，呃，他首先先 Thank you Andy and Q for the amazing works and talk. 呃呃。The、audience from the Facebook has a question. As a designer working between experimental territory, commercial realm, and teaching, 
How do you think they influence your words? Oh. Yeah, great question. Um, for me, you know, some of those territories are just like bouncing back and forth um, between each other. Uh, you know, like I mentioned in the talk, you know, some of the early space type generator stuff was uh, inspiration was from teaching demos to students and working with students on motion tracking. And then that kind of led to something else and kind of led to something else. And I think at the, the core of all of the stuff I've been experimenting with, it's been about learning. You know, if ever I feel like I'm hitting a little bit of a block of not knowing what to do, any sort of creativity block, for me, it's always about learning then, you know, like what can I do to, to learn instead? And oftentimes that will just bounce right back into whatever I'm doing in my um, experimental practice. Um, and in terms of teaching, I mean, yeah, it's that kind of con conversation and interaction with students that uh, keeps that learning going even um, even for the teachers, you know, sometimes it's uh, talking through some of these things that really helps me as uh, somebody lecturing or kind of showcasing or, or discussing some of these things, talking through it will sometimes help it really sink in. Uh, and yeah, the commercial realm and the kind of experimental territory, I mean, those have really been feeding off each other, you know, very uh, beneficially. Um, sometimes I'll be doing something commercially and think like, you know, it'd be cooler if I did it this way. So then that'll speed in, into the experimental. And oftentimes I'm taking stuff, uh, some of these sketches um, from my studio practice and incorporating them into commercial projects or pitching them with commercial products. So, if you have any questions, you can ask me to ask you to 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 ask me 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 to ask 的时候，这是一个学习的过程，所以这就是一个不断在教跟学之间不断反复的过程。而且另外一方面，他在教学的时候，其实很多时候跟学生说明、跟学生互动的时候，也可以去激发更多新的灵感跟想法。所以就再度会回到他这个实验性的领域。那至于很多可以看到后来的商业合作，其实很多时候也是从商实验性的领域之后，把他这些会诊出来之后去做商业上的提案。那至于在商业上的提案，也许他们在创作过程里面或实际操作的过程里面，觉得有。些东西虽然这次客户并没有采用，可是也许去实呃实践出来之后会有意思，他会再度回到实验的领域，所以这三者之间是不断反复，然后来来回回之间产生出来的结果。好，那我们还没有更多的呃问题或者是说心得想要分享的。Thank you for the questions, and I think there's another question coming up. Okay, uh. 再一个问题是说，想请呃 Q 分享设计的美感，刚该如何养成？他的他的经验是怎么样 ？So when you create these works, it actually requires a lot of aesthetics and design aesthetics. How do you build up these kind of aesthetic values, and how do you polish that over time?、Uh, yeah, that's another great question. Um, you know, some of the um aesthetics that it It's、uh, they're building off of you know of course lots of it is is down to the the typeface you know like some of those very core aesthetics of letter forms and stuff and kind of how beautiful they are.、Um, a lot of the other kind of aesthetics come from the self and like how these things are built. Yeah, maybe maybe that's a good way to kind of think about how these are established is by you know the processes in which the type or the graphics that are generated. Are then like interpreted in motion,、um, kind of I think stack beautifully, you know, and like sometimes seeing the function, sometimes being able to see the backbones of of how these things work, kind of open up these new realms of thinking about、um, how they're displayed, you know, like some of these layers in in front of each other, some of the compositions they make,、uh, and then other times it's down to mistakes, you know, <laughs> sometimes when you're coding you do something wrong, you know, there was that part in the the. Demonstration where you know the sphere kind of exploded, and that was really unexpected.、Um, other moments of 
these things being unexpected come with establishing some of these variables and some of these sliders and sometimes taking some of the sliders and uh, since you're able to work in the background of the code, taking the sliders and ramping them up to crazy lengths and heights and seeing what happens when you match some of these values together. Well, that for me, like the, the play, I guess. So developing the tool and then playing with the tool, those both kind of yield different, you know, senses of, of visuals and, and beauty and, and play. 在过程里面，当然会有很多，就是比如说，当然我们在看到很多成像的一些呈现啊，图像里面，其实很多时候取决于这个字体它的字形等等。那这些字体字形它本身的美感当然是非常重要的。但另外一方面啊，去思考的时